talk about um, Professor uh, William Easterly, or Bill Easterly. Um, the title of his book is The White Man's Burden. Um, and uh, there's a long subtitle. Um, uh, this is a, a sort of a, a different perspective of a prominent development economist. Um, and we'll be contrasting somewhat with um, Jeffrey Sachs's view that we covered on Monday. And I'll look forward a little bit and talk about Banerjee and Duflo's um, viewpoint too that we'll talk about on, on Friday. Um, so a little bit about Professor Easterly. He's a professor of economics at New York University, co-director of their Development Research Institute. He was he, he, a uh, senior fellow also at the Brookings Institute, and he had 16 years at the World Bank doing research on development. Um, and uh, the title of his book is really representative of what's in it. Um, so the, the subtitle is Why the West's Efforts to Aid the Rest uh, have done so much ill and so little good. Okay, and he talks about the bad things that have happened because of giving aid. Okay, and he talks about, um, you know, how it's done so little good. I mean, he's going to give arguments about, for instance, you know, all this aid was given and it had no impact on any of the indicators on a country and moving it ahead. He'll talk about things like that. Um, you know, I read just about. I don't know, maybe six months ago, uh, this uh, later book he wrote um, called The Tyranny of the Experts, okay? Um, it's a good book. It's a good read if you like his, this, if you read this book and, and liked it, I think you'd like to read The Tyranny of the Experts also. Um, so he uh, quantified what Western aid has given. Um, it's 2.3 trillion, like holy cow, wow. Okay, over the last 50 years. Um, you know, what, what, a lot of this, the idea of aid really started after the Second World War when the United States had the Marshall Plan to try to help Europe. Okay, and you know, it looked at it and it worked. I mean, it really worked. Okay, so people said, wow. You know, it was, it was an absolute disaster in many ways to the, the ravages of war. What? Europe, help, really helped Europe come out of that. So people start saying, well, wait a minute, why don't we do this again somewhere else, okay? And so he says, well, we spent all this money, 2.3 trillion. Uh, well, you know, his argument is, is it's had little impact. It's been a big waste of money. So he calls it well-intentioned compassion, but the aid isn't re meet you, reaching needy people. So he, he contrasts this with the sale of a popular book, and, and what he uses is the, uh, at the time, the book was, uh, uh, what's that guy with round glasses? Um, Harry Potter? Yeah, Harry Potter. He talks about the Harry Potter distribution problem of the book. It comes out, and it's like, boom, everyone's got a copy in their pocket, right? I mean, it, it just, it's incredible, millions and millions of copies. And then he says, he contrasts that with getting a, a 10 cent medicine to a dying child. And says, we can't even do that. So what's wrong? What's wrong with this picture kind of thing? Um, so what he blames it on um, is big Western plans. Okay, he's big on that. He's going he's gonna to blame it on that. Uh, so his view is, and quoting him, is the right plan is to have no plan. Now, you've got to be careful with his statements and interpret them in context. What he's talking about is the big worldwide plan type plan. Of course, in engineering, when you're on the ground, you sort of want to have a plan for a project. You have to be flexible, and we'll be talking more about that when we get to chapter four, okay? He's not talking about that kind of low-level, flexible plan. He's talking about the big, inflexible plan. Um, so his goal is he wants to try to improve the process and change the mentality. So he says that um, the mentality of people are, he characterizes these as planners and searchers, he calls them. Um, and he says, the planners, this is the wrong approach, and the searchers is the right approach. Now, um, I mean, I, if you're going to pick one word to describe the two options, it's probably an okay word, but it's not always descriptive. I'll just warn you of that. But he, he draws this distinction. It, it is interesting what he's doing. And so here's, um, I know, I'm sorry for the font size, but uh, here's the, um, the planners and the searchers. So we're gonna talk through this, and what I'd like you to do is put your engineering hat on. Okay, so you're trying to f solve a development problem. You're trying to end poverty. 
And what Professor Easterly is saying is the people on the left, the planners do it one way, and the people on the right, the searchers do it another way. And so I want you to pay attention to this in terms of thinking about how you solve engineering problems, okay? Because that's what he's talking about is a problem-solving methodology. The methodology his claim is on the left is bad, the one on the right is good, okay? So planners, what do they do? They announce good intentions, but they don't motivate anyone to carry them out. And what he means by motivate is he literally means things like payments. You know, giving somebody money if they get it done. Okay? On the right, well, searchers find things that work and get some reward, some incentive. Money, for instance. Okay? And uh, on the left, planners raise expectations. Maybe promise a donor that you give us all this money, we're going to end poverty in X country X. But take no responsibility for meeting them. In other words, if they, his argument, he talks about this quite a bit in the book. Look, I mean, what are the repercussions of not meeting expectations? Okay? This is a really important issue in humanitarian engineering. Um, and we're going to come back to this. Um, so what, let's say you go to Guatemala and you try to work with the community to help fix something, do something. And let's just say you just absolutely fail. What are the repercussions for you? You come back here, you have a nice meal, you go home, sleep in your warm bed, uh, you know, what does it matter? So my claim is there's only one way to motivate university students. What is it? Not beer. <laughs> Credits. What? Credits. Grades. Grades. Okay, so this is, we're going to talk about that. In other words, the question is, if you go there and you fail, what should your grade be? Do you give it a grade A for effort? <laughs> a, this is a difficult issue, okay? Um, searchers accept responsibility for their actions, okay? Planners determine what to supply, what to give people. Searchers find out what's in demand. And this creates a lot of controversy. You know, you go to school, let's say they, or, I'm sorry, you go into a uh, country and they have very few schools. So you look at it and, 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 and the natural to say, well, let's build schools, okay? But easily you say, wait a minute, what if they don't want schools, <coughs> okay? What if there's no demand for schools because the kids can't go to school anyway because they gotta be out working in the fields all the time for survival of the family. And so this creates a fundamental conflict between supply and demand. This idea of supply and demand applies to many areas, like some, it, the, these people would, would talk also about contraceptives, for instance. Whatever supply you have, if the religion of the country rejects that, you're often not going to get much demand, and so on and so forth. There's many, many issues come about in supply and demand. Planners um, apply global blueprints, whereas searchers adapt to local conditions. This is a big issue we're going to be um, focusing on in this class. And the, the whole, when we get to engineering for community development, this is gonna, <coughs> we're going to pay a lot of attention to this issue. Um, and um, I mean, I'm really in sync with him on this. I mean, local, there, there's no, every problem is local. Every problem is different. Now, you can get lucky sometimes, and other problems are similar enough that you can develop a, a solution in one location, and it can work for other areas, right? But you can't assume necessarily that would be the case. Planners uh, at the top lack the knowledge at the bottom. In other words, you sit back in your big thing and you do your simulations, you do your statistical analysis, you do your nice big plots, and you look at HDI, IHDI, blah, 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 and you don't understand the ground. You, that's why in the book I emphasize there's two ways to look at most of these problems. That is up close and at a distance. I think they both have value, but if you're not doing some up close, forget it. I mean, you can't understand what's going on on the ground. Um, searchers find out what the reality is at the bottom. Planners never hear whether the plan got what it needed. In other words, to implement the plan to make it work, uh, they don't use feedback. They don't have accountability. They don't have accountability, they don't use feedback, they can't succeed. Of course, as a feedback control guy, I really buy into that. Um, searchers find out if the customer was satisfied, and they use feedback and have accountability. So think of how, how 
They say, you go to Guatemala, you, 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 you walk away, it looks like you succeeded, everybody's happy. You come back a year later and you, like what you should have first ask is, is it still working? I mean, and what's so depressing sometimes when you go back is like, no, it's been, go it's been down for six months because of, you're like, oh, I never thought of that. Uh, you know, so you find out you were a lot less successful than, shouldn't have had that warm fuzzy, you know? You, you're a lot less successful than what uh, happened in reality. Um, planners think they already know the answers and think of poverty as a technical engineering problem. I'm quoting him here, that the planners' answers will solve. All right, I'm gonna beat up on him on that one. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's just a, that's the typical economist view of what engineering is about. The calculus problem, one solution, straight linear path, and f solve the problem and get the answer. That's what he's talking about. He shouldn't have used engineering there because engineering is not over there on that issue. Very clearly not. No, one, no engineer can succeed with that, that kind of, a, of approach, okay? Um, Searchers admit they don't know the answers in advance and believe that poverty is a complicated tangle of political, social, <coughs> historical, institutional, and technological factors. And yeah, it is, right? That's why I'm spending all this time up front talking about all these big, nasty problems that set context for what we're trying to solve, okay? Planners think outsiders know enough to impose solutions. You know, uh, this comes down to the fundamental issue of need. You know, uh, I look at you from afar and my data show that, you're, you know, 50% of your people are making less than a dollar a day, therefore you need this solution. Uh, wait a minute, they actually have solved that problem, it's other problems that are important. You know, so you gotta talk to people on the ground. Um, searchers hope to find answers to individual problems by trial and error, experimentation, I believe only insiders have enough knowledge to find solutions and that most solutions must be homegrown. We're going to really be talking about that a lot, actually. Um, respecting the locals, talking to the locals about their homegrown solutions. In some cases, not being able to improve over what they're doing locally. In other cases, bringing some innovation on board and helping out. Uh, engineering, anybody that know, has ever developed technology know that it's huge trial and error, right? And remember, and, and not only just to get the thing released, I mean, just think of the idea of software update on this. That's trial and error, right? Oh, we screwed up. They, we, they, they let out iOS 8, right? Oh, it's causing all these problems. Oh, here, you can do a software update, no problem. And they fix it. Well, computer scientists or engineers back at Apple said, oh, we didn't realize that would be a problem. Code, 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 release. And it's fixed. Well, that's trial and error when the technology's in our pocket. Okay, fortunately, that can, is easy to do with this. For the technology, like a, a water filtration system, physical technology on the ground, whoa, that's not easy. I mean, you know, you can't just like upload physical entities. We can't do that quite yet. And don't tell me about 3D printers. <laughs> okay. Planners keep pouring resources into a fixed objective despite previous failures and a track record showing the objective infeasible or the plan does not work. They may even escalate the intervention if a previous intervention fails. In other words, this is this, is this sunk cost effect, you know, you just keep investing in something and it, because you think it should work and you say, well, we haven't invested enough, that's more, and it just becomes a mess. Searchers find concrete proof of solutions to help the poor by trial and error in specific cases. Okay? So this is a rather um, uh, reasonable list, right? I mean, you know, I, the question is, we're going to come back and analyze the, these lists a bit from uh, different perspectives. But what uh, Easterly does is the following. So he says that foreign aid is dominated by planners and it hurts the effectiveness of searchers. And he uses an example, Jeffrey Sachs, okay? Um, Sachs' book came out first, okay? So he's able to, and he knew, of course, he knows Sachs' work anyway. And so he says he's a planner with grand utopian promises and he's going for the big push. Remember, Sachs did go for, the, he was arguing for the big push. Uh, $70 a person, he said, would solve the problem, get everybody up, one rung of the ladder so they get in the market economy and everything could take off. And Easterly's saying, 
no way. You know, he's saying that's just a big aid push. It's all going to go down the toilet. It's going to end up in corruption. It's going to end up in just huge waste because you're not going to really get things to the people that need them. So what you got to remember, it's not like these, these are mortal enemies. These people have different philosophies, and they both, when you read these books, it's very clear that, that Sachs and Easterly care so deeply about fixing these problems that they're going to argue very strongly about how to do it right. Okay? I mean, they care a lot, both of them. Um, okay, so aid will not end poverty, um, but it can solve um, desperate needs of the poor and give them new opportunities. So he does back off a little, Easterly, and says, okay, he's kind of saying we can end some suffering. And he's not saying that's bad. Okay? But he wants to get at root causes. I mean, a lot of people in this field want to get at root causes, right? So the problem goes away permanently rather than just a, a little fix of a symptom. We'll talk more about that later. Um, so he, he really wants specific, concrete, successful approaches and, and to take those approaches. It emphasizes feedback and accountability, saying it's a key part. Feedback from community, feedback from, um, for, in terms of um, markets exist, you know, if I can sell something at a certain price, uh, the way the economist thinks is about it is, is, well, then the customers have given you a, used your pricing signal and they've responded appropriately and it, they're saying it has enough value for me to support that. So he's saying that this creates, uh, using the market makes a lot of sense in these very complex situations, okay? And this happens in democracy. Right? If, if the person is really, really bad, we vote them out, right? Um, hopefully. Um, it, that's feasible in a country. So what he, he says is fundamentally there's a, a lack of feedback. So what, what this means is, is that, you know, you, you, you put all those eight dollars out, you never find out if it worked, and then you just throw more dollars out, you never find out if it worked. But if we're asking people about on the ground what worked and what didn't, then the next, it, there's nothing wrong with failing the first time, but the next time you're going to iterate, you're going to improve things, and improve things and improve things. That's what he's arguing for. Um, so he, he's big on this accountability thing. He feels that agencies and practitioners have to be accountable. And that's people like us. He's talking about everybody has to be accountable. You know, um, and, and I think he's got a real good point here. Um, because there's just no real repercussions if I go somewhere and do something and fail. I just come home and I'm happy and eat well and like I was saying before. Um, aid agencies are, are accountable to the rich, not the poor. And the big promises that they make in order to satisfy the rich. So the rich give big bucks, okay? And they have to say the right things to get them to be, give the big buck. So they're accountable to the donor. But then <laughs> the money's given, the rich people get the big warm fuzzy, and then what really ended up happening in the end? One of the problems is, is not just, so, so let's say you do some aid effort. What do you do, wait a year and find out if there was an improvement? Or does it take 10 years? So that's one of the problems too. It's hard to know how long you have to wait. Um, so people in rich countries generally don't understand the effectiveness of foreign for aid and, and hence do not complain about it. In other words, if they, he, his claim is, is that everybody knew how bad it was, how ineffective aid was, you cut the aid budget because it's just not working is his claim. Okay, now, Sachs is, has a very different view as we said the other day. Sachs says, you know, we're not giving nearly enough. What was it? The eight conferences in the past, uh, um, the OECD countries uh, promised 0.7 um, of their GDP. Um, that hasn't been realized for almost everyone, especially the United States. Okay. So um, Sachs says, come on, you promised, do it. All right. And, it, and then he, it's interesting, he's, as I'm reading this guy, you're sort of trying to figure out what, politically where they stand because um, he, he really is, he's, well, and he says, Hold on, planners and searchers are not the left versus the right, the liberals versus the conservatives, okay? So big plan support comes from, uh, the, went from the left because they like big government programs, okay? The right, however, supports this because they like a benevolent imperialism to spread capitalism, reduce opposition to the West. 
Amazing, right? So it can get support from the left and the right, this whole idea of big aid support. But on the other hand, it can get criticism. So the right says solutions will come with homegrown markets and democracy, but the left doesn't like the Western imperialism trying to make the rest like the West, okay? So if you're in the left or the right, it doesn't mean, it's not clear what you're gonna support with respect to the big plan. Um, he, he claims the right approach is to think that they're both wrong, okay? Um, and try to find specific ways to help. So his claim is that poor people have already accomplished four, far more for themselves than the planners have accomplished for them. Now on this point, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, this is a comp, I had a little bit of trouble with the, his, uh, I, think, I didn't think he felt, and spent enough time justifying that claim. I'm quoting him there. So that argument, if you buy into it, you say, let's all just <laughs> ignore them. They'll fix their own problems, um, right? They're doing a better, if he's saying they're doing a better job than we can, well, then you should just ignore them and let them alone, okay? Uh, this is a complicated, this is complicated, that, that claim. Uh, does anybody know why it's complicated? I mean, why is it, remember, remember Millennium Development Goal, um, number one, um, extreme poverty in the last, whatever it was, 20 years or whatever, cut in half in the world. So what was the biggest driver of that cut? Why did we get so, the numbers, why did we get the numbers worldwide? What, was it big aid? Claim, he would say is no. Yep, China and India, and in, in, in the changing of their economies towards really it's a market-based capitalist model. It's had, it's had a huge impact. It's brought, for instance, in China, tons of people out of poverty. It's had a huge impact. So those numbers, he could argue that the bulk of the numbers, the reduction, doesn't come from aid. It came from free market. Okay, but there's a lot of others too. So. That, I think this is a really complicated statement. That's a complicated claim. I think you, it, it would be very difficult. You could write a whole book on that claim alone. Um, the legend of the big push. So the big push idea came from Marshall Plan back in the 50s. Um, and then uh, it was going on in the 50s to try to break traps, poverty traps. So the, get, the evidence he claims against the big push idea is that countries with below average aid have the same growth rate as countries with above average aid. So he does, he does the statistical analysis, okay, uh, and that's the claim. Um, then he studies bad governments. There's ways to quantify what a bad government is, okay, uh, lead to slow growth more than poverty does. Uh, and he shows cases where aid did not accelerate growth. In other words, you give a bunch of aid and it didn't push up. Right? Um, so he claims there's no evidence of a positive impact of a big push. And he, what, he can, he, what he calls for is he calls them controlled experiments. When I say more later, um, the primary thing is the next lecture. We're going to talk about Banerjee and Duflo. Then he talks about you can't plan a market. So... Um, there's been a lot of push when, when aid is given it's usually it's not like just for free there's certain stipulations okay if you transition to a free market economy we'll give you billions of dollars type you know condition all right um, and he says well free markets work but he says free markets reforms do not and then you can't just tell someone to create free market economy in their country and expect them to be able to do that. Um, and the question is why? Um, he says that it, it depends on a, sort of a bottom-up emergence of institutions and norms and it's very complex and difficult to understand and says that you can't impose this from the outside. Well, he gives some good reasons here. I think this part of his writing is very convincing. Um, the econ you know, having economic freedom to produce, buy, and sell leads to specialization. We talked about that last time. And then the whole problem of the emergence of financial markets for loans, um, for savings, and for investing is very important. There are a lot of people in development that underline that. 
um, you know, your, your ability, um, the, the microfinance is a huge um, effort all over the world. Um, they do not only loans, um, they often have uh, savings. You, you remember in um, Living on One Dollar, um, they talked about the requirement when you got a loan was that you would open a savings account with the microfinance institution. So this kind of stuff is happening. Um, there's also a big push to put all the financial services on a cell phone um, for, for people around the world. Um, that seems like an incredibly good idea. Um, why are homegrown markets difficult to establish? Well, um, he, said, he gives a number of reasons. For instance, cheating. Um, when a customer cannot observe the quality of a product being sold, or payment at the time of service is not possible, so payment may not follow. And then there's, he, he, he goes into this issue of different societies having different levels of trust of strangers, okay? Because you sort of need a kind of trust to get a free market economy to work, do how transactions work. You gotta have an expectation that, you know, that you're gonna get paid, for instance. It may not come right away, but it's gonna come. Uh, and if it doesn't come, you have recourse in a legal system, but in the, some of these developing countries, they don't have that kind of recourse, so it becomes a lot tougher. Um, the less trust issue, so uh, a good way, source on that is uh, the World Value Survey. How much do you trust people? And there's quite a variance. It's pretty amazing to study that. Um, in, 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 the, in the United States, there's relative to the rest of the world, there's a pretty high level of trust. Um, Whereas in a number of developing countries I've studied, there's quite a low level of trust. Um, and that really hurts sort of an economy is what um, Easterly is arguing. Um, so in fact, he says culturally, in a, in a number of places in the world, you trust your family and friends, and then it's just fine to cheat everybody else, okay? Um, that really changes a dynamic in, in a lot of ways. And, and remember, it's when, you're, when you're talking about these transactions, you might be like, wait a minute, I go in, I buy a cup of coffee, I pay, it happens right away. But I'm talking about a lot of things like, I, you employ me. I gotta wait till the end of the week to get paid. Am I really gonna get paid? And what am I only gonna get paid? Are they really gonna come through with what they said? So there's a lot of those kind of interactions too, okay? Next. Uh, there's a lot of family enterprises in poor countries that cannot be ignored. And courts to enforce rules are unreliable, maybe corrupt, you may have to pay them off, the court themselves, and it may be too expensive to prosecute cheating on small transactions. So um, usually these trade relationships in these countries are built over time, and they're often among members of the same ethnic group. Now that still happens in this country too. Can someone name an ethnic group that's sort of known for trusting each other and they have business transactions kind of in a closed ethnic community? Can somebody name one? The mob. The mob. There's one. What's another one? Various ethnic groups in New York City. He uses Jewish groups here and talks about the industries they do. And there's the classic examples of, of like for Chinese or whoever that do, they have the networks that they run in, in, uh, themselves, okay? But this is going um, on all the time in other countries and you can't break into these networks. And if you try to impose an economy, a free market economy, these networks are gonna fight back. They're not gonna just let you impose a free market economy. Um, so, and of course they reduce the potential gains, it's just like a, a of like a trust, I mean, it's, you know, um, okay. Security, security is a tough issue, okay? So if your property and people aren't protected in a society by, um, you know, the police or the military, and you feel insecure, that creates many, many problems. So what happens is, is you get, the, he calls us this, threat self-protection games that go on. Um, and that self-protection is costly. So usually people are surprised to see this. Um, and I've heard a number of people over the years comment about the US on this. So you go to a developing country and you see people with big guns all over the place. Okay, the, the machine gun, the Uzi, whatever. And they're guarding various things and you know, and you're like, 
you know, what's going on here? Because you're sort of like, do I feel secure around that person, that guy typically, that guy, or should, um, you know, I be afraid of him, or what are they protecting? Why do they need the big gun? Do they really need it? If they need, if they hold the big gun, they must need the big gun. So they must, uh, there must be a real problem here. You know, so it's not clear whether it should make you feel more secure or less secure, right? Right? And uh, of course, all those people have to be paid. Now, often they don't make much money. I mean, they're coming from a nearby slum, whatever. I mean, they're not. But it, it, it creates a, a really, um, you know, bad environment. So, what happens is in these situations is once somebody starts arming themselves, well, what happens is the obvious thing. Everybody else feels like they need to arm themselves. And so you end up with this sort of perpetual, you know, at each other. Um, and uh, it, it's costly uh, in many ways, um, at, uh, you know, just in paying people or um, in gates and barred windows and all this stuff. Um, uh, aside from it being unpleasant, it hurts the economy, it hurts trust, it's, it's a big problem, okay? Um, politics. Good governments could fix policies to help promote the market, but poor countries have bad governments. So in other words, what he's saying is you might be able to have a good government that could change policies and promote and have a good market, okay? But he's saying they don't do it. Why? Because it's probably against their interests, their own personal financial interests to free up the market economy. They're probably controlling it to a certain extent to make sure that they fill up their own pockets. Okay? So he says we have to get tough with bad governments and force them to change in order to get aid. Um, he says governments in poor countries aren't so bad and let them produce their own development strategies. So he names a number of countries. He says, look, there's bad governments, but there are some good governments, too. <coughs> he said, in those situations, give them the freedom to fix the things themselves. Don't come in from the outside and say, well, this is your problem. Do it this way. Just respect them and let them do it. Okay? So he would sort of look at a government and say, this is a well-functioning government. They're oriented towards development and aid. And study them carefully and say, okay, go for it. And give them help. Okay? Um, so, but at the same time, he argues for democracy and the, and the strength of democracy and what it can do. Um, he says that planners try to impose a good government and it doesn't work. Um, so it, this is a complicated issue. You know, imposing a good government, I think we all know that's complicated. Uh, you know, witness the history since uh, the Iraq war. I mean, can you create a democracy for a country is the question, right? And uh, so, you know, how can you change and improve democracies? Um, and there's all sh different shades of democracy, okay? You can't just think there's like, oh, you either have it or you don't. You know, it, it, it's, it's very complicated how good a democracy functions. Um, so feedback, democracy can give feedback. Remember the diagram we had in the social justice part? You know, um, votes, changes, that was the feedback loop, right? Um, so he asked, well, can a democracy emerge in these situations or will there be um, a tyranny of the majority? The tyranny of the majority is the idea that there's enough rich people that they just say they vote, they have a majority, and they just vote against the poor people, and they're just they're they're not going to get any better. Okay, and that happen can happen in any democracy, right? The Constitution is supposed to protect against that. The Constitution is supposed to guarantee certain inalienable rights, right? I mean, it's supposed to help with that problem. Um, well, you have to protect rights and freedoms, and um, avoid corruption. Um, the problem is there's plenty of corrupt authoritarian governments in uh, poorer countries. And then he gives an example that is, is fascinating. Uh, basically the pattern over history is if you have too much of a natural resource like oil, you have a huge problem and you don't develop. You, you end up with a poor country for a long, long time. And uh, he, he uses examples in the Middle East um, and, uh, you know, 
Um, and in particular, the, the, the classic example right now is Venezuela, right? Venezuela is in a very bad situation. And, uh, you know, what's happening to all that oil? I know oil prices are down worldwide right now, but this question has been ha asked for many years in Venezuela. Um, and, you know, the question, what you have to ask is how good is the government? In its current form, under Maduro or under Chavez, or go back and back further and further, and ask where the real problem is. What his claim is, is that historically, no country with lots of oil has succeeded, period. In all cases, they failed. It's kind of weird, because you would think you could use the resource to get an advantage, right? And get ahead of everyone. That doesn't work that way. People sort of just, you know, what the gas price in uh, Venezuela now is around 17 cents a gallon. What are they doing that for? Because it keeps everybody happy. So they're giving it away. So it's sort of like you, you rely on this thing. It feeds you, and you don't advance, you know, um, unfortunately. Uh, those are very complex situations, though, of course. Um, you know, but in, in Venezuelans get very passionate about it these days. Um, so there are counterexamples where governments with aid are not always failures. So he's, he, he starts to liken aid to oil. And he says, if you just give them this stuff, it's like oil, and therefore they're never going to succeed. But then he backs up and he says, yeah, but there's other examples where when you give an aid, they aren't a failure. The whole situation is really very complex. It's hard to uncover broad principles. Um, so governments, he gives some amazing examples where, you know, all this aid, you give some huge amount of money to some government, and like, you know, 1% of it makes it to the people. It's just absurd. Um, so he feels that because of these kind of problems, we got to change the view of always working with government. Just stop, in many cases, just stop working with the government and try to get right to the people. Um, he wants to try something different, okay? He is opposed to intervening in other governments so, and overthrowing them. This is a, <laughs> at first time when I heard him saying that, I was like, what? And then I did a little reading and so there's some people that believe that in some countries that are really tough situation, that the US should go in just militarily overtake the country and buy a government and put it in place. What a concept, right? I mean, so um, there's all kinds of controversy on how to fix these things. People get very frustrated. So here's what he says should happen. So this is his recipe, his plan, right? First of all, eight, eight institutions. Number one, drop the utopian goals. Be more humble. Number two, Focus on the simple things, just getting them vaccines, antibiotics, food, seeds, fertilizer, borehole, water pipes, textbooks, and nurses. I mean, get the basic things on the ground, helping the people, okay? He says it does not promote dependence. It helps them to raise the payoff from their own efforts. This two and three, whether they want to admit it or not, are, are between Easterly and Sachs are very similar. I mean, Sachs, remember, said, let's focus on infrastructure. Let's put it in place so they can get ahead. That's what he's saying, really. It's very similar. Um, and then he calls, of course, for accountability um, of everyone in achieving this. Best practices. So he call, calls for quanti quantitative analysis of what works and what does not. Now, this issue, I'm going to leave what he means till Banerjee and Duffel, because they explain it very well, what he means here, okay? And he calls for people to understand problems and learn to be creative about how to come up with solutions, to be a searcher. Number three, the marketplace. He says three things to the marketplace. He wants social entrepreneurs close to the poor who propose projects to meet their needs. We're going to talk about social entrepreneurship in the next week, okay? Next, individuals and institutions with technical and practical knowledge. Ooh, that sounds good. That's highly relevant to humanitarian engineering. Uh, next, donors who have funds they want to give away. So get them to help set up a better um, marketplace for aid. And he talks about this idea of Whittle and um, Karashi. Um, in particular, he talks about this. This, this is a fascinating website. If you go in here and click um, Global Giving, um, it, you can go in there and there's 
you can submit a project. Your student projects would work here. You can submit a project and say, I want this much money. And then people, donors go to the site and they say, ooh, that's a good idea. Click, pull out the credit card, pay. And that you watch and see who's getting what. It's pretty interesting. Now, what's interesting about it, when I've been at the site, a lot of US projects are being funded this way. I felt too many relative to the rest of the world. Okay, But it's, it's uh, quite an interesting idea. It sort of bypasses the whole aid structure, puts the donor right with people on the ground. So you know, you, you'll see the projects are fascinating. You have a project from someone in the developing world, they, 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 they got on the web, they put their project there, and they asked for, you know, $25 or something. Sort of like, click, yeah, I'll help you with that. So it, it's a cool site. Um, so he says this is helping solve a coordination problem, avoiding bureaucracy, avoiding the corrupt government, and uh, avoiding political manipulation by donor governments. I don't know if it's working. It seems like it's working. There's, there's donations going on. Things are happening, for sure. Um, I, it would be intriguing if, like, the Guatemala trip or another trip <laughs> put it in there. What if a Buckeye is looking through this thing and they say, hey, boom, click. Why not? It doesn't cost, it doesn't cost to submit. At least it didn't when I looked at this thing. It's easy to submit. Isn't this similar to Living on One Dollar website? Like, you go there and you can also... Yeah, you can donate. Right. Yeah. Development vouchers. So agencies... Um, he, he says this is the way aid agencies should work. So here's the idea. All the aid agencies take their money and all put it in one pot. And then they buy what they call a voucher. Just think of it as a little card. And then they give it to the extreme poor. And a poor can redeem it at any NGO in the area. I go to one NGO and I want you to help me with my health problem. I want to go to another NGO, I want you to help me with food, okay? But you give the people a choice, and it's crucial because then what happens? The ones that aren't performing well don't get any money back. The ones that are performing well get money back. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so this is a market-based system to locally assist um, the poor. Um, he, he's creating a competition. He's giving voice to the people. Do you see that? He's letting the people decide what's good, what they want, number one. That's a nice feature of the market, right? And then, it, 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 and then let them decide how good the service was, whether it was a value to them. You see, that's feedback. That's giving power to the people. It's empowering the people. Uh, that's a nice feature. Um, so the ones that don't do a good job, suddenly uh, if you're an aid agency, you start feeling some pressure. It's like, how am I going to survive? Because the people in the aid agency, well, they got to get put paid too, right? And if they're not doing a good job, well then suddenly uh, they're out of a job. Well, that's how we live in an economy here, right? Um, so this puts the poor in control. Um, he says, though, one issue, um, individual vouchers won't work for community projects like building a road, a health clinic, or education, clearly. But what he says is give the community a community voucher and let them cash it in on a, buy a road, buy a building, okay? You give it to the group and let the group decide where to go with. And it's still market-based, then. Okay. So he says we have to test these things and see how they work. He's not claiming this is like like well-proven solution. He feels this should be tried. Direct cash assistance. So this surprised me a little on reading his book. Direct cash assistance, uh, it's to the poor, should be tried. Um, so, <laughs> you know, this is really... Um, going to raise some eyebrows for some people. Charity is often frowned upon. You know, you, take, you hand someone cash, and what, do you, what are they going to do with it, right? I mean, go walk down High Street. You know people are asking for cash, right? Do you hand them cash? Do they buy drugs? Alcohol? Who knows what? Or do they help themselves 
get ahead. You're in pick whatever country. You give you give Antonio in living on one dollar some cash. Oh look, that guy's gonna do the right thing, right? So so he's saying we need to just try it. Just just give people money. Uh, and in fact, in a homework problem I have, there, there's a woman that is saying the same thing. She's like, look, if you consider the, the expense of the big aid bureaucracy, all the people you have to hire and employ and the buildings and everything, there's all this overhead. And she computes the overhead. And she's saying, that's all a waste. So what? It, it, so in her calculation, she says, let's say I give you each a dollar. Let's say half of you go buy beer, the other half try to help their education along. Well, I've succeeded, haven't I? Because the bureaucracy costs too. So as long as your success rate is higher than your overhead rate, you go for it is what these people are saying. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a, there's a lot of people write about um, development and argue just from the get-go that you don't give things away. So then, then this is really complicated for technology, right? Because so, so let's say apply it to humanitarian engineering. Should you give technology away? See, it's different with technology because in this system, he's talking about giving the people money. Money is, you know, it's fungible. They can, they can go around and buy what they want to help themselves. That's a good idea. You give them a water filtration system, well, it's not, they might be able to sell that water filtration to their friend, turn it into money, and then buy what they want. But... Per se, they're not going to be able to trade that probably. That, you know, it's not tradable like money. It can't easily be converted into what they really want if they don't want the water filtration system. Okay. Um, oh, and don't think that's a weird example. Um, in, in, uh, in Columbus uh, last year, a, a tour of the homeless um, camps, six homeless camps, and uh, I was talking to various people and they say, they say that, you know what happens when they go and these various groups in Columbus go and try to help, they give them tents. They don't need tents, they have tons of tents. So what they do, they all just walk down to the store and sell their tent, and get money. So, so, you know, this kind of thing, when you make a donation of something, it, it can and often is converted to something else that they really want. And that's the problem with giving away something you think's useful for them. Okay. Now, if, if, if you know, on the other hand, um, you know they need it. They've said they need it. The community needs it. And then you give it to them. That's better, right? And then they, they're not going to convert it. They're going to they're gonna use it and value it. Um, next, he says there should be competitions and rewards for effective development. Um, so these are interesting so he says create a fund make advanced purchase commitment to whoever succeeded in developing a vaccine against malaria so you create a reward get a bunch of donors get a billion dollars let's say and just say okay world whoever solves the problem of malaria okay will give you a billion dollars and create a competition and go okay um and, and that, that's, that is an intriguing thing, right? I mean, that kind of thing happens with U.S. funding agencies. They'll say, you, whoever, they'll create a competition. Whoever solves this technological problem gets a million dollars. Okay? Some of my friends here at OSU have entered those, those competitions. Why not? He's saying, why not do it for developing world? It's not a new idea. That's an, an old idea. Um, and then he wants to suggest that we should uh, survey the poor to see if they're getting good aid um, and give them voice and vote. And then he, he also wants to spend some money, not just on the people to get aid to people, but to like oversee the process, independent observers that say, yeah, you're doing a good job, you're not doing a good job. Um, so just to wrap up, lessons for the engineer. Um, Easterly's uh, perspective is really, um, quite friendly to an engineering perspective. Um, focus on local, provably correct, and tangible solutions. That's what we're doing in chapter four, okay? Um, and his call for searchers approaches and, it, and it, with his deep criticism of current approaches like SAPS. If you look at the left and right side, basically the left is good engineering methodology and the right is bad engineering methodology, almost to a T, all right? You just, you just wouldn't think of doing this stuff on the right, okay? So it's not like, it's odd for us. 
So I, you can ask, is this guy an engineer? And the answer is clearly no. Um, he doesn't understand engineering. Okay, why? Well, he, he has his error. Say planners think of poverty as a technical engineering problem. So he's, he's essentially contradicting himself because he doesn't understand what engineering does. Um, so he doesn't understand engineering, like the creation of technology. The, the, that's what most, I find, non-engineers don't get. They don't get that we're inventors. We're creators. Okay, fundamentally that's what engineering is always about. And uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not surprising that he doesn't get it. Um, okay, so in, uh, some people don't understand how practical engineers are. Um, so we cope all the time with constraints and trade-offs and optimized designs. In a lot of ways, you can call engineers as professional tinkerers, okay? We'll talk more about that later on. So we're, we're searchers, really. But also, um, an engineer, the way it works, if you, if you don't go into humanitarian engineering, you're just going to go into standard engineering jobs. Well, we always evaluate demand, right? I mean, you're not going to create a technology without a demand, necessarily. If usually what you do is you say, well, there's a demand for this, and you fulfill the need or the demand with a the technology. There's counterexamples of that that are important. You know, there was no demand for Facebook. It was created, and then the demand came, right? So, so it happens the other way, too. I mean, it's, the old saying is necessity is the mother of invention. Well, invention is the mother of necessity, too, right? I mean, um, you invent the microwave oven, I can't live without my microwave oven, right? Or my iPhone. Um, okay. Other best practices. Um, he, he misses a number of really important characteristics of being searchers. And it's probably okay because for technological solutions, you know, he's not an engineer. So it's, it's excusable, but... You know, I have, to, I have to point these out because engineers often accept an imperfect or partial initial solution. We don't wait for the science, we come up with a solution, okay, and just do it. Um, and we do iteration all the time. Design is all about iteration. Nobody gets it right the first time. You just keep repeating, okay? Um, and this idea of robustification we'll come back to. I, we, I'm uh, want to finish up. So. Um, he talks about digital humanitarianism and global giving, um, e-tracking and management of vouchers. Um, we're going to have some homework problems on dig digital humanitarianism. Um, also, um, later on, there's a new book that just came out on that topic. If you're interested, let me know. And uh, I'm going to come back to this issue. I just want to mention it. We already did. The only viable economic reality approach for humanitarian engineering in the university is grades. Okay. Uh, now, uh, different people degrade differently, um, you know, but if you're going to go to Guatemala and you're going to have a, a project, or you're going to go to Honduras, or you're going to go to Ghana, or wherever you're going to go, there ought to be a grading system in place, and I would claim that it, it ought to be, uh, have some very clear guidelines and, and be something in terms of was the community satisfied with you? So the question is, could the community grade you? Okay. Um, so we'll come back to that issue at the end of chapter four. That's all I have.